Well, we know Gonzaga's offense is going to be spectacular this season, but what is the defense going to look like? It's impossible to replace Chet Holmgren entirely. So how is Mark Few and the Zags going to it's going to adjust? We discuss it all right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to take you through another season of Gonzaga hoops. All right, it is Mailbag Monday. Love that Mailbag Monday is back. It is also Hat Week. For those of you checking out the show on the YouTube channel, last week we did jerseys. Every single day of the week, this week we're doing a different hat, starting with the Locked On Beanie repping the brand today. Uh, Mailbag Monday, for those of you who have not participated in the past, very simple to do so. You can reach out to me on Twitter at Andy Patton CBB whenever you are thinking of a question. Helps if you tag me or tag Mailbag on it. If not, I'll still put it in my notes. I'll still get it ready for Monday or Sunday afternoon when I record the podcasts. I also post a tweet on Sunday morning soliciting questions. You can respond to that tweet to make sure that your question gets into the show. Finally, you can email me Andy Patton 013 at gmail.com. Very easy way to ask multiple questions or ask a question whenever you're thinking of it so you don't forget in advance of Sunday afternoon. All right, lots to get through today. Lots of great questions. This first one comes from Havilla Benjamin on Twitter. He says, the Zags offense is almost never a concern, but what needs to happen for this team to be elite defensively? To me, defense is the key to surviving off nights in the NCAA tournament. So how can this team make defense its calling card? Yeah, this is a great question, and I think an absolutely true point. Gonzaga has rarely had bad defensive teams. In fact, thinking back, the majority of the last 10 years when Gonzaga has been really, really good, their offense has been better than their defense. That's kind of been part of it, but they've rarely really had bad defensive teams. Last year's team was significant significantly improved defensively because of Chet Holmgren. There's just no other way to look at it. But this year's team, I think the biggest things are really growth in the backcourt. Specifically, the two sophomore guards, Hunter Silas, Nolan Hickman, how they improve is going to have a significant impact on this roster, both offensively and defensively. Hunter Silas, in particular, is already a very, very good defensive player. Last year, in the snippets that we saw, he played 12, 13 minutes per night on average. We saw a player who had good defensive instincts, who has otherworldly athleticism and a level of tenacity on the perimeter that really made it so that the opposing team's going to have a rough, rough night every single minute that he was out there on the floor defending them. With an expected increased role this year and that, you know, that tenacity, that experience, that your physicality is still going to be there. In fact, it's all going to be improved. He's going to be he's going to be a better defensive player this year. He's going to be a better basketball player, period. You hope that every player is getting better, especially from their freshman year to their sophomore year. But for Salas to be a really impactful perimeter defensive player in 20 minutes per night as opposed to 12 or 13 minutes per night, that in and of itself is a big improvement for the Zags. Hickman's a big hinge, a big hinge offensively more than anything else, just because Gonzaga's offense relies on a really steady, productive point guard. They've had it for the last 20 years, effectively. Their seasons have ebbed and flowed by how their point guard production is. So Hickman's going to have a huge role there, but he's going to have to, he's going to have to be a good defensive player as well. There's a lot of really good point guards in college basketball. A lot of them are in the WCC. A lot of them are on Gonzaga's non-conference schedule. Hickman's going to have to play really well on that end of the floor for this team to really reach their overall peak, specifically on the defensive end. I think Malachi Smith is a huge addition as well. He's 6'4", he's 210 pounds. You watch some highlights of him at Chattanooga. There are times where he just straight up bodies somebody and rips the ball away from them. He's stronger, he's more physical. Obviously going from the SOCON to the WCC, while the WCC is not you know, the, the Big Ten or anything like that, it's still... There's good athletes. There's a lot of high-level performers there. And then obviously Gonzaga's non-confidence schedule is loaded with talent. But for Malachi Smith, he's big, he's strong, he's physical, he he's active and engaged on the defensive end of the floor. I think 
his addition is very, very important to Gonzaga. I think he's a much different player than Andrew Nembhard. He's not directly replacing him, but a lot of the minutes that went to Nembhard are going to go to Malachi Smith, and Smith is bigger and stronger than Andrew Nembhard, and I think that that is going to help Gonzaga significantly. And then, of course, you have Rasir Bolton and Julian Strother both returning. The hope is that both of them continue to improve defensively just by being in the system for another year, by knowing more of what is asked of them. Uh, obviously, they won't have the the security of a shot blocker like Chet Holmgren behind them, but hopefully that that elevates their ability to be better perimeter defensive players. And then the front court is obviously the other aspect of that. And I'm going to answer that here in the second question. Uh, this one came from Christian via Gmail. He says, is it possible for the Zags to be ranked in the top 10 in both offense and defense by the end of the season? Is it possible that even without Chet, that the team defense might rise to the occasion and be better than last season? So I'm not going to touch much on the offense because, yes, Gonzaga being top 10 offensively is, is quite likely to happen. They're really, really good on that end of the floor. Outside shooting on this team is ridiculous. Drew Timmy is one of the best low post scorers in the history of college basketball. Between those two guys, between expected improvements from the younger guards, I think this team is going to be elite offensively. Defensively, it's going to be hard to be better than last year. Chet Holmgren is the single most impactive one, impactful one-year defensive player the Zags have ever had. Brandon Clark is high on that list. Do not get me wrong. He is great. But Chet Holmgren is the most impactful defensive player the Zags have ever had. And they're going to go into next season without him. And most of his minutes are going to go to smaller players. Obviously, Efton Reed is the kind of the replacement in the actual front court for Chet Holmgren. But the expectation, and again, there's no confirmation, but what many people believe is that the Zags are going to start a small ball lineup with Julian Strother playing the four uh, and Drew Timmy playing the five, similar to that 2020-2021 team where Drew Timmy played the five, Corey Kispert played the four, and the Zags played three guards. So if you're replacing 28 minutes from Chet Holmgren and most of those minutes are going to Hunter Salas or Rasir Bolton or Malachi Smith or however you kind of want to chop it up, that's those guys are good defensive players, but you're losing a significant amount of rim protection. And I've talked about this with, with Efton Reed a handful of times on the podcast. He's not, he hasn't been a rim protector, mostly because he was not asked to be a rim protector at LSU. Will Wade ran an interesting defensive system where Tari Eason, who's now in the NBA, who could probably guard one through four capably, was asked to be a rim protector instead of asked to play away from the rim, whereas Reed was asked to hedge screens and play defense kind of away from the rim. I think Efton Reed at seven feet at 240 pounds with good footwork, with good athleticism, I think he's more than capable of being a, a good to very good rim protector in time, but I don't think he's going to be a highlight reel defensive player immediately. And I also think he's going to play in the ballpark of 12 to 15 minutes per night, just because of the way that this roster is constructed. That kind of leaves the situation where rim protection is an issue. Quite frankly, rim protection is an issue on this roster. I, I I don't see any way to look at this roster and not see that as a, a relatively glaring hole on this team's unit. I don't think it's going to be destructive. It's not going to cause them to be like, you know, a borderline tournament team or be in question of whether they're going to win the WCC. Like, I don't think that it makes that level of an impact, but it's hard for me to see a situation where this team is as good defensively as last year's team. Even though Chet Holmgren... One player doesn't make a team that dramatically, but he's pretty close. Like his defensive impact last year really can't be understated enough. And while I think there are some things to be really excited about with Gonzaga's defense, particularly in the backcourt with Hunter Salas's growth, growth with Nolan Hickman's expected growth with the addition of Malachi Smith. And I think Drew Timmy has improved defensively. I think Efton Reed is going to be a good defensive player. We haven't talked about Anton Watson, who's been an outstanding defensive player for the last three seasons. That's going to continue. The Zags are going to use him to set half-court traps. They're going to use him to play really, really good defense away from the perimeter, to soak up rebounds, to do all the dirty work that he's been very good at throughout his career. But I don't think he's magically going to take a significant leap forward. He's probably going to be about as good as he's been the last couple of years. So losing a Chet Holmgren really hurts. I would be surprised if this team was as good as last year's team defensively. I, I, I don't think that they're going to be bad. I do not think that they're going to be top 10 in the country. I just, I think that they're going to win a lot of games by scoring more points than the other team. And, and while, again, that doesn't mean they're going to be bad defensively. I don't want to make it seem like I think they're not going to be good on that end of the floor. It's just hard for me to imagine them reaching a really, really high level of success without a lot of rim protection on the roster. All right, we're going to come back in the second segment. We're going to answer even more listener-submitted questions. But before we do that, 
I want to tell you all about Simply Safe. The numbers don't lie. In the last decade, over 4 million people have chosen Simply Safe home security to protect their homes. You don't earn the trust of that many people without doing something right. At Simply Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. They protect you with cutting edge security technology powered by 24 7 professional monitoring agents who always have your back. With 24 7 professional monitoring, Simply Safe's agents call you the moment a threat is detected and dispatch police or first responders in an emergency, even if you're not home and can't be reached. Simply Safe blankets your home in protection with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. HD security cameras for inside and outside your home and smarter ways to detect motion that only alert you when a threat is real. And even hazard sensors that instantly detect fires, flood, and other threats to your home. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash locked on college. Save 20% on your Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan and get your first month free. Visit simplysafe.com slash locked on college to learn more. There's no safe like Simply Safe. All right, segment two. Still Andy Patton, still Locked On Zags. Want to thank all of you who have made Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. Remind you all to check out the show on YouTube. Trying to get to 1,000 subscribers. We're so close, y'all. We are so, so close to hitting that 1,000 subscriber mark. You can see all of the episodes from last week where I wore a different jersey. You can check out Hat Week this week. Uh, fun times happening on the YouTube channel. Check it out if you haven't yet. We're going to get back into the mailbag questions. This next question here in segment two comes from Twitter user at dad risk. He says, how accurate is it to classify this team as just a worse version of the 2020, 2021 team? He said similar age construction, but that's not much of an insult in my eyes, given how amazing the other team was. Where do you foresee this team stacking up in terms of best Zag teams ever? So, Yes, I do think that that's a fair way to kind of start explaining this team, but there's so much nuance, there's so much context that I think that blanketly comparing two teams doesn't doesn't really tell you the whole picture. Yes, roster construction-wise, and I kind of alluded to it in the first segment already, and I've alluded to it in previous episodes as well, with Gonzaga likely going with a three-guard lineup with a, a forward-type player playing the four position and Drew Timmy at the five, that's pretty darn similar. It's hard not to see the similarities in a roster. You know, the 2020 team had Jalen Suggs, Andrew Nembhard, Joel Iai, Corey Kispert, Drew Timmy. Three guards, one six-foot-seven outside shooting forward, and Drew Timmy at the center. That is likely how this team is going to line up with Nolan Hickman, Rasir Bolton, Malachi Smith, Julian Strother, and Drew Timmy, the expected slash projected starting lineup. The Zags could do something entirely different. Hunter Salas could sneak into that starting lineup. Anton Watson could sneak into that starting lineup. Heck, who knows? Maybe Mark Few has Efton Reed and Drew Timmy start together. Uh, Julian Strother starts at the three, and they only start two of the guards. I think that's fairly unlikely, but it is possible. And that team... If that's the lineup they're running out there, that's going to look very, very different from the 2020-2021 team. But if we make the assumption that the starting lineup is going to have Julian at the four, then yes, I think that this team is going to look pretty similar. This team also is much deeper, particularly in the backcourt. If Dominic Harris is healthy, this team's backcourt depth is staggering. Even in the front court, though, if Ben Gregg is truly as advertised, he's gotten leaner, stronger, more physical... That's really nice depth to have in the front court. You have Caden Perry, you have Braden Huff, who aren't really expected to be contributors on a nightly basis. Those two guys are very good. Braden Huff is, a, is young. He's a project. He's pretty raw, but he was a top 100 player in the class of 2022. Caden Perry was a top, I think, 60, top 70 player in his recruiting class, the second ranked player in the state of Washington behind Palo Bancaro. So that is a lot of depth to have. I would rather have more top end talent than depth, particularly with Mark Few as the coach, because as we know, Mark Few doesn't like to play very deep lineup or very deep rotations. Six, six is pretty low, but seven, eight, eight is about as far as he's ever gone this year. It looks like we might be looking at nine, but we've thought this in years past where, hey, they're going to have to go nine. Mark Few, he didn't have to do anything. <laughs> we may think, hey, there's no way Mark Few could play lower than a nine-man rotation this year. He'll, he'd find a way. He would find a way. So I think the 2020 team had a little bit more top-end talent. But if we see some significant growth from the two sophomores, from Salas and from Hickman, uh, certainly if Malachi Smith and Efton Reed get into the lineup as seamlessly as we expect them to, or even perhaps more seamlessly than we expect them to, that's going to be a huge boost for this team. I think this team is absolutely capable of winning a championship. 
absolutely capable. And in that regard, part of the question is, where do you see this team stacking up among the best Zags teams ever? Well, if they win it all, they're number one. There's no, there's no debate about that. Since I think they're capable of winning it all, I believe this team has the capability to be the greatest Gonzaga team that has ever that there has ever been. Having said that, looking right now on paper at this team and some of the other Gonzaga great teams, I think they're top five. I think it's hard to look at them and say that they're going to be better than that 2020-21 team because that team was ridiculous, didn't lose a game until the NCAA tournament. That's pretty darn rare. The 16-17 team was fantastic, had the one loss to BYU, and of course, we're winning the national championship game with about six minutes to go. That 17-18 team, or excuse me, that 18-19 team, both those teams, frankly, were very, very good. Uh, suffered some earlier losses in the NCAA tournament than we would have liked to see. Uh, that 12-13 team, of course, in the mix as well, even though they fell early in the NCAA tournament. Uh, I think this year's roster is as good as basically all of those teams. I think when all is said and done, they will be a top five Gonzaga team of all time. But until we know how the season finishes out, it's hard to know exactly where they're going to fall on that list. Next question, another one from user Dad Risk on Twitter, who says, will Gonzaga be in the WCC in 2026, and should we be concerned if they are? Yeah, I got to tell you, dude, I it's hard for me to focus on things that might make me anxious four years from now. So I don't know if I can give a full answer there uh, about how we should feel about something that may or may not happen four years from now. Um, to answer the first part of the question, I don't think Gonzaga will be in the WCC in 2026, or at least if they are, it might be because they have already made plans to go somewhere else. It just hasn't happened yet. Usually when you make an announcement that we're going to join a new conference, it's like a year or two buffer before it actually happens. It's possible to me that Gonzaga announces they're going to the Big East or the Mountain West or some other thing has happened. A new conference has been created or they've moved some things around or the Pac-12 changes their mind. And, and that it's announced in like 2025, hey, Gonzaga is going to join this conference starting in 2027. That is something I could see happening. And if that's the case, then I don't think that anybody would be concerned that they're still in the WCC at that point. So that's where you kind of need that context, some nuance. Certainly 2026 could roll around. Maybe the conference gets lucky and replaces BYU with a really, really good program. Maybe a couple other programs catch fire. And all of a sudden the WCC is a consistent four bid league. I don't think this is particularly likely. I don't want to go on record as saying that I expect this to happen. But again, that's where that context is important. In 2026, if the WCC is routinely a 3-4 bid league, I doubt there's going to be a lot of concern. If in 2026, Gonzaga is still in the conference, they have not made any headway in joining the Big East or the Mountain West or the Pac-12 or anything like that, and the WCC hasn't replaced BYU or replaced BYU with Seattle U or Grand Canyon, and the league is still maybe a 2 likely a two, but rarely a three bid league. We're not seeing any continuity. The only other program that's consistently good is St. Mary's. If all of that is true four years from now and Gonzaga has made no headway. Yeah. Maybe the fan base is going to be a little concerned. Maybe there's going to be some, some anxiety, some stress around it in that situation. But again, there just needs to be more context to it. I think ultimately Gonzaga will make a move. I think ultimately they're going to be in another conference. Whether the Big East opens the doors and lets them join, whether they find a way to get all of their sports there, whether they house their other sports somewhere else, I don't know. There's a lot of particulars that need to be ironed out. But I do think that Gonzaga is probably going to be competing somewhere other than the WCC four years from now. All right, next question comes from Christian via Gmail. Christian says... Though it is a different sport, the MLB playoffs have once again taught fans that being hot at the right time is more important than midseason success. We see this in the playoffs in many sports, but it is glaringly apparent in the small sample size situations like the NCAA tournament. What do you think some keys are for peaking at the right time? Well, first, I'd push back a little bit on the concept that peaking at the right time is more important than midseason success. When you look at professional sports, and th certainly the playoff situation in professional sports versus college sports is different, and I'm going to get to that. But professional sports, by and large, there's not actually that much parity. For the most part, the teams that are in the World Series or the NBA Finals or the Super Bowl are the, are the best teams. Like this, that's generally who it is. The teams that do the best in the regular season often win the championship. Now, clearly the Dodgers just got eliminated very recently by the San Diego Padres as I'm recording this. And so that is a, a primary counterexample. And I'm sure many of you are listening to this and thinking immediately of counterexamples. And I'm not saying they're not there. There are a ton of them. But for the most part, two of the three or four best teams in the league are the teams that are in the championship. That's pretty often what happens. In college sports, 
particularly in college basketball, since that's what we focus on on a podcast about the Gonzaga Bulldogs, there is more parity because the NCAA tournament is a fickle being. It is a one and done. You have one bad game. You are out. So peaking at the right time is very important for the NCAA tournament. I would also point out that for the most part, even still in the NCAA tournament, teams go on really spectacular runs, but your final four, your championship, Last year, there was an eight seed there, but it was North Carolina. For the most part, you're seeing top two, top three seeds that are ending up making it. So it's not often that you see this like team go on a torrid hot streak and go all the way to the final four or the national championship. Usually the cream rises to the crop. That's just what always ends up happening. To answer the question more specifically about how to peak at the right time, I think if people knew exactly how to do this, they would have, we would see it a lot more. It seems so random a lot of the time. There is some stuff that goes into it, certainly coaching and, and making mid-season adjustments, making late-season adjustments, finding ways to get something out of your team that you weren't getting out of your team previously. That's critical. And Mark Few has been criticized in the past for being slow to change rotations, slow to change lineups, slow to make adjustments in that regard. And I think there's a, you could make an argument that that has impacted the Zags and the fact that maybe they they limped to the finish line a little bit. Last year's team really didn't have a ton of momentum at the end of the year. They didn't play well in the WCC tournament. They didn't play well in the first two NCAA tournament games, and then they lost to Arkansas. That team did not get into the tournament with any kind of momentum, and it was a factor in them losing. I don't think that that's debatable at all. Why it happened is certainly up for debate. You could argue that Mark Few rode some of the guys a little too hard and should have played some of the younger guys a little bit more. I don't know if that contributed. It's hard for me to think like, well, if we'd seen more of Hunter Salas in January, then maybe Andrew Nemhard wouldn't have missed 13 shots in the game against Arkansas. Like, I don't know how specifically those things are related, but when you start to see a pattern develop, when you see Corey Kispert struggle in the NCAA tournament, and then you see Julian Strother struggle in the NCAA tournament, you start to wonder if maybe that is something that is causing part of the problem. I think that a lot of players will tell you that one thing that helps them peak at the right time is like having a wake up call or suffering a, a what a good loss is the way that it's often called. I, I had Jeremy Jones on the podcast a while back and he talked about the loss to BYU in 2017 and how they had this big meeting afterwards and they kind of got their crap together and, you know, went on a big tour run after that tour through the NCAA tournament, and went to the national championship game. So yeah, play, if players believe that, I'm inclined to say that there's something there. If a player believes that we had this meeting and it helped us win, who am I to tell them that that's not true? You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like there's got to be some level of truth to that. Whether it's a placebo effect or not, I don't know. But they seem to believe that it helps. So I think that there's something to that as well. But for the most part, I think if coaches knew how to unlock their team to get them to peak at the right time, everybody would be doing that. <laughs> we would see that constantly. But there, there, it seems like a lot of it is just kind of luck, kind of random variance, just the way that sports work. That's why we love sports. That's also why we sort of hate sports. That's kind of how, how that relationship uh, develops for sports fans. All right, two segments down. We're going to come back in the third and final segment. We're going to talk Zags in the NBA. We're going to preview the women's team a little bit. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you all about Bet Online. College basketball is less than one month away, while college football and the NFL are underway, and the MLB playoffs are in full swing. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews for all the leagues this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. They even have lines for coaching changes across every major sport, so even in the offseason, you can get your fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zag, still chatting here with Mailbag Monday, answering great listener submitted questions. This next one comes from S underscore DeWitt 11 on Twitter, who says, possible landing spots for Tilly, NBA or overseas. Yeah, for those of you who may have missed this news story, the Memphis Grizzlies waived former Gonzaga forward Killian Tilly on Saturday. Four days before the start of the NBA season, really tough time to get waived. Uh, I was feeling pretty pretty down about it. Killian Tilly has been one of my favorite players for a long time. Many listeners will know that my dog is named Tilly after, of course, Killian Tilly. So a bit of a bummer to see him 
job list right before the basketball season starts. I'm very, very f- grateful and happy that he was able to turn his two-way contract into a guaranteed contract uh, on January 1st of 2022. That means that he is going to get money. He's going to get paid. His family has been taken care of in a way, uh, even though he's not currently employed. I wrote about on scoresagscore.com. For those of you who have not checked it, I will post a link to this article in the notes of this episode. I wrote about how he's a great fit for the Portland Trailblazers, who currently are going to start Yusuf Nurkic at the five and Jeremy Grant at the four. Every other backup on in the front court for the Blazers has less NBA experience than Killian Tilly, every single one of them. Uh, they also do not have a lot of big men who can stretch the floor. Grant can, the starting power forward, he certainly can, but there are other players. Olivier Saar, he can, but he's hurt right now, and they just signed him to a two-way contract, so he's very inexperienced. Trendon Watford, not really an outside shooter. Drew Eubanks, not an outside shooter. Greg Brown was kind of an outside shooter at Texas, but hasn't showed that so far in his brief NBA career. So I think Portland's a great fix. I think the 76ers could potentially be a good fit, but I also think I don't think he's going to sign a NBA contract before the start of the season. I would be, in fact, I'd be stunned if that happened. I think there's a small chance that somebody gives him a two-way contract if they're willing to release somebody else out of their two-way contract and bring him on board, which I think there are a lot of players who have two-way contracts where Killian Tilly is perhaps a better fit for that team's roster or just straight up a better basketball player. But I, a lot of teams aren't going to want to make a move like that right before the season starts, justifiably so. So that leaves Tilly in kind of a tough spot. Does he sign overseas where he's certainly going to command a lucrative amount of money and has the opportunity to either go to his home country in France if he chooses to or find another opportunity to play? Does he go into the G League route and hope that somebody picks him up that way? There's a lot of options for Tilly, and it really kind of depends on what he wants to do. I think he's an NBA player. I think he's good enough to be an NBA player. I think the fact that he's played 55 NBA games, has started multiple NBA games, has had very productive nights in the NBA, pretty clearly point to a player who's capable of being an NBA player. But the NBA is a ruthless game. There are dudes who play well for a year, two, three years, who get cut once, and then that's it. Like This happens fairly regularly. It is a tough, tough deal to stick in the NBA. So if he, if the overseas, if they come calling, if some some high level Euro League teams come calling for him, I wouldn't be shocked if he chooses that avenue as well. Next question comes from Jacob Quarter Two on Twitter. What are your thoughts on the Clark contract? Do you think Clark will still be in Memphis when his contract is up? Yeah, back to back Memphis Grizzlies questions here. Brandon Clark, right before I hit the record button on this podcast, Jacob snuck this question in right under the deadline. Uh, Brandon Clark secured a four-year, $52 million contract extension with the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, I thought he was going to command a little bit more. I'd seen some comps having him in the 60, 65 range even. Uh, but frankly, $52 million is awesome for a player to the 21st overall pick. Late first round picks often don't even make it to a second contract. Uh, we all know, listening to this podcast, that Brandon Clark should not have fallen to 21st in that draft. Uh, he was a better basketball player than many of the players who were selected before him. And he got $52 million, which kind of proves that point. <laughs> it proves that in a lot of ways. Um, it's really hard for me to know if Brandon Clark's still going to be in Memphis four years from now. It, it kind of depends on some other factors with Memphis. But if Memphis is still competitive and you look at the the core of their roster, of Desmond Bain, Jaron Jackson Jr., of course, John Morant, uh, they're pretty young. Dylan Brooks, pretty young. So there's uh, not a lot of reason for me to believe that Memphis is not still going to be pretty competitive four years from now. And if they're still competitive... I don't see any reason why Brandon Clark wouldn't be a part of that. Like, I think that they would trade him if their team was trying to tank. If three years from now, the Grizzlies are bad and they're trying to tank and they want to get out of some of their contracts and give good players to other teams and acquire future draft picks, then yeah, I think Clark would absolutely get traded. But I think Memphis is going to be good four years from now. And I think he's going to play, I think he's going to play every single one of his NBA minutes over the next four years in Memphis. After that, hard to say, depends how he performs, obviously. But I I think he's going to be, I think he's going to be a Grizzly for a long time. Next question comes from Gary via Gmail. Gary says, I listened to a Tony Bennett interview where he talked about the Cavs trip to Italy, team building and watching the seven to 10 players in competition. The Zag women haven't had an overseas trip recently. Why not the Zag men? Is it Fuse involvement with USA basketball? Yeah, the Lady Zags went on a trip in 2019. Uh, Teams are allowed to do it every four years. So you don't see teams do this all of that often because they can't do it all that often. That's per the NCAA's rules. Uh, They do get extra practice time. But one of the biggest reasons that this is not 
a huge priority for Gonzaga is because their schedule is set up in such a way where the players take summer classes in order to be on campus over the summer before the school year starts. In order for them to be practicing and doing anything, they have to be enrolled in summer school. My knowledge of how academic support and compliance is a little bit outdated because I haven't worked in this industry since 2017. You guys might have heard a whole heck of a lot has changed in how the NCAA treats this stuff uh, in the last five years because of NIL, because of various other COVID related rules and stuff. So I'm not super privy to all of it, but my understanding was that Gonzaga players were able to report over the summer because they were taking summer classes. This is why you see so many guys leave after three years and they're able to grad transfer because they took a bunch of classes over the summer so they can get a degree in three years. So if they're in school, you can't take a whole group of kids who are all enrolled in summer classes and abscond over to Italy with them. It's just not an option for them. There is a gap period between academics and between the end of the summer school and the start of the academic school year. But again, semester schools are more likely to have schools start in late September. When I was a student at Seattle U, I think we started right around my birthday, which is September 23rd. Gonzaga starts in early September, late August sometimes. So I think that that, I think that their just academic year is so different that it makes it more difficult. Clearly it's not impossible because the Lady Zags made us, made this trip and that is an accurate point. So it may just be something where Mark Few's not viewing it as worth the headache, uh, doesn't, hasn't found the right time, the right country, the right dates, the right situation. Maybe they are looking into it and they just haven't found it. Maybe he's just not interested in doing it. Maybe USA basketball does have, I, I, I don't think that, I think it's very possible that that is a factor, but Tony Bennett has been involved with USA basketball in the past and many other coaches, John Calipari has been involved. His team has gone on these trips. So Maybe the timing just hasn't lined up. I don't know the exact situation, but I do think that the academic calendar likely has a big role in this decision. Final two questions of the show. I kind of lumped them together here. Jeff via Gmail says, what are your thoughts about the Gonzaga women's basketball fan fest on Saturday? The women's team seems to be getting more and more skilled as a team over the past few years. Looks like the ladies Zags could be in for a big year this year. Christian via Gmail had a very similar thought. Jeff, he says, what do you see as the best case scenario for the Lady Zags in the WCC or in the big dance? Yeah, this seems really talented. They've been talented for the last few years. When Coach Lisa Fortier was on the show, I think that was back in early July that she came on the podcast. We talked about how she'd lost like 10 players to graduation in the last two years. Like this team is funneling in and out really talented players year in and year out to lose a Jill Townsend, to lose the Worth twins, to still have a really successful year to then lose Melody Kempton. Like it's, they have so many talented players and they just continue to rebuild and rebuild and rebuild this year. You lose Sierra Walker. She's going to, she's a professional basketball player overseas. She was one of the best sharpshooters the team has seen in a long time. You replace her with Brenna Maxwell, who spent three years at the university of Utah scoring in double figures in the PAC 12, which is a really good women's basketball conference. Uh, you bring her in. She's a great outside shooter. She's also more of a low post scorer, uh, has more ability to score in different ways. Uh, she also was a guest on the podcast, talked a lot about what she brings to the team. Fantastic listen. The Trunk Twins are back, of course, and they're now seniors. They're going to be really, really good this year, uh, both expected to be all WCC caliber players. Then, of course, you have Vani Ejim. She was the sixth woman of the year last year. She was all WCC second team. Now she's stepping into a bigger role, similar to Melody Kempton, who was sixth woman of the year, and then an all WCC first teamer the following year. I think Ejim is going to do a very, very similar thing. So I'm very excited about this team. They have a fun schedule. They're playing in the Bahamas uh, for their, their tournament in the non-conference. They're going to start that, that tournament against Louisville. They got the potential to play some other really high-profile programs as well. They, of course, got the non-con game against Stanford, as they always do. I think if this team does well in the Bahamas, or if they sneak a win or Stanford or both, obviously, I think there's a really very real chance that they go into the WCC season as a ranked opponent. They're expected to win the WCC. BYU and Portland are both very good, but Gonzaga is better. And unless they have some injuries or just don't meet expectations, they're going to win the WCC. They're going to win the regular season. They're going to win the WCC tournament. And there's a realistic chance if all of that comes together, we're talking about a team that's a four seed or a five seed right in that range. They were a five seed a couple of years ago. They could do that again. Like this team is definitely capable of being a top five seed or at least a top six seven seed in the NCAA tournament this year from there from there it's anybody's game 
Maybe they have the right amount of momentum, as we talked about earlier in the podcast. I'm not going to be putting money on the Gonzaga women's team to win a championship necessarily, but this is a top 25 caliber team who I think could end up seated as such and could find their way into a Sweet 16, maybe even an Elite Eight. And again, once you get to that point, just got to win a couple of games and all of a sudden you're having the, the best season of in Gonzaga basketball history. All right, that is going to do it for me today. Great week for content. We got more player previews coming your way right here on the Locked On Zags podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube as well. Check it out there if you haven't done so yet. Finally, thank you again to those of you who have made Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. If you're itching to get back into college hoops and want to hear about some of the other top tier teams around the NCAA, check out Locked On's newest college show, Locked On Cougs all about the Houston Cougars. Friend of the show and former guest Parker Ainsworth is in his first week at Locked On Cougs, and it's a great way for fans of college basketball to learn more about Marcus Sasser and Kelvin Sampson's outstanding recruiting class. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags.